in there until it drowns? Oh, sorry, sorry, oh. sorry buddy. Oh. I've never seen a turtle like this before. Did we only oh get my fish? Goodness. Oh, it's breathing. It's yep. alive. The other thing to know about the, the birches is that this is the current year's shoot here. So it's it, the stem is elongating, the leaves are alternating up the stem. We have a couple new ones emerging at the axis of the, of the stem. If you go back to last year's growth, there's a stem in there, but it's just elongating so slowly that consequently the leaves look like they're coming clustered. All birch do that. This is yellow birch. What are you getting out of the yellow birch? Root beer. It tastes like root beer. Root beer. Yeah, it, it tastes like root beer. Oh, by the way, anybody know anything about the taste of striped maple? No. Who wants to try this? <laughs> yeah, let us Report know. back. A lot of times I'll sit, sometimes with the feet actually kind of in the stream. And of course I'm usually playing. So it's like, where are my buggers? And I'll be looking and checking out the awesome, awesome one I just found. Yep, holy crap. And it's beautiful and it's big. This is Cordulogaster. It's, it's the genus for it. Family's Cordulogastridae. Going into the water and pulling out a water scorpion or a giant diving beetle is just great. You have everything here. You have the big longhorn beetles. You've got um, the lunar moths. And you've got bugs that are just charismatic. They're the charismatic microfauna. It was Cranberry as a student that made me really love them because I started looking at them and saying, wow, they're pretty cool. And that was the moment that, that I want to be an entomologist. And also, I do have the bio station to thank for it. Is this the one that we're looking at here? That you think? No, we think this is the, yes, yeah, black shoulder. It's got that single stripe here. That's what makes it the spiny lake. This is kind of really characteristic of, of that. So, Jewel Weed, the leaves are very, very thin. I won't even see paper thin. I mean, oh my gosh, isn't that amazing? I feel my like It's not just that we learn about plants, but that we learn from plants. And you can't do that unless you have time with them, unless you are surrounded by them, and unless you're really embedded in a place where your primary relationships are with the green world that's around you. The genus is Umbilicaria. Umbilicaria. These beautiful, beautiful lichens are like all lichens. They're not one being, right? They're a symbiosis between fungus and algae. Fungus and algae, right, right. Each one of these salis, these big ones, could take a hundred years to grow. Wow. Yeah. And they'll photosynthesize until they turn into a little black crisp. And they don't die. They just wait until the water comes again. And then their algae will say, okay, ready, set, go. And they'll start photosynthesizing, making sugars to feed to their fungus. Learning in the field is just one of those things that makes everything seem more applicable. 
when we were harvesting cattails and we were doing something that was really practical and it would be necessary for you if that was your way of life. That's just one of the things that really stands out to me. We were all just like, had such a connection with the plants, how we were dependent on them and just the fun that we were having. It was just incredible. Ethnobotany is the study of the relationships between plants and people. How do the plants sustain us? And in reciprocity, how do we sustain the plants? Draw him from here too. Can you point to him again? Mm -hmm. He's right there. You can go out and you'll find someone who's as excited about a weird bug or a weird flower or a weird mold or something as yeah. you are. You know, I do it back home and my friends are like, oh no, she's doing it again. But here, there's somebody who's going to be as excited as you and there's yeah. probably going to be somebody who knows what it is. You can see the little patch right at the front of the carapace there. There's like one really long hair right in the middle of them too. I can go and talk to people about spiders for an hour solid and no one gets tired of me talking, which is kind of nice. I've never experienced that outside of this college. Ooh, you see that? That's a green frog. He sounds like a banjo string. I mean, he rivets. Those frogs are super fast. They have a tympanic membrane, which is like their little ear behind their eye. They have a cool gradient that's black almost to green. They can fit more niches because of that. That's my favorite frog. Now it's just like, oh, they're offering insects of the Adirondacks. And then I, that's when I found out my, my passion for like beetles and stuff. I really like beetles. What do you like about beetles? It's like they're nice. They like play with them. They're, I don't know, they're like respectful. Right? They're nice. I like them. And then you could just catch them. So far I have a chrysomelid beetle. Gyrated beetle, Lampyrid beetle, which is a firefly, a megaloptera, I don't know the family yet, a deer fly, and a snout beetle. Pinning, I, I just put music on and I just stay there for hours. It's just nice, it's calm. It's like you don't just, you don't think about anything, you just think about like making it nice. So when it all comes together, it's just like a
perfect, beautiful picture. If you stand in one place for a while and watch the dragonflies, you'll see the patterns and how they move, and it'll make them easier to catch. Flip your net over so it won't escape. Then reach into the net and pick up the dragonfly. Make sure you hold both of its wings so you hold it firmly and it doesn't escape. When you're done looking at your dragonfly, you can just put it on your hand and it might shiver a little bit if it's cold and it might sit there for a few seconds before it flies away. The old days it was all male and now it's better than 50% female. The old ESF movies, you would see these young boys coming up into the forester and being dropped off and remembering what it was like yourself. I first came here when I was about 19 years old, and that summer changed my life. It was here that I took my first moss class, and I just fell in love. By the time that four-week session was over, I knew 100 plants by common name and genus and species on site. It was an incredible, intensive learning experience. Because we're isolated here, there are 70, 80 of us surrounded by wilderness. We just have each other to learn what it means to live in community is a tremendous teaching of this place as well. Being a field biologist is also, I think, an exercise in humility. And humility, I think, is one of the greatest assets that a scientist can have. It helped me to appreciate the equality of all species, that these other species are our brothers and sisters. I have to actively think of that but it's easier to do when you're out in the natural world. The biggest problem of our time that I see in my eyes is just this disconnect with the environment. If something's not in your mind and you're not thinking about it consciously, it's easy to just disregard it. I think ESF students, as they grow up and move on with their lives, are going to be spreading their knowledge everywhere they go and this respect for the environment. I think that's what we have to offer. Oh. <laughs>